the very unfortunate drama that has been unfolding in the Mavoko area, Machakos County, but very close to Nairobi, some people think it's part of Nairobi, has left many Kenyans very confused. They don't understand. Having listened to the story of those very unfortunate Kenyans, who had put up houses invested in the pieces of land that they had acquired from a land buying company does not really clear the air. But one thing I guarantee you, if you pay close attention, by the end of my show today, everything will be clear. Yeah. But for us to fully grasp what is going on here, it is important that we all understand how land is grabbed in the country called Kenya. Many of us are very ignorant. We don't understand. Many of us imagine that some people who don't know what they're doing pounce on a piece of land and grab it. And then they use kifua to keep it. <laughs> Nothing like that. Land grabbing in Kenya and we need to understand this to understand what went down at Mavoko and what we should expect in the coming weeks and months. Land grabbing in Kenya is a very intricate yeah, operation by people who know exactly what they are doing. And it involves, number one, politicians. Number two, senior people in the land's office. Number three, senior government officials. That is the truth. And don't lose sight of the fact that land grabbing has been fine-tuned, developed into a fine art, so to speak, since the independence of the country called Kenya. So this is how it's done. Let's take a fictional example so that we understand all the processes. Somebody who has money decides that they want to develop rental apartments at a certain location. And of course the land does not belong to them. So the first question they ask is who owns the land? Oh, some peasants. Some ordinary wanainchi, not wanainchi. Some ordinary wanainchi in the country called Kenya. Next question. What is the level of education of members of that family? Response, oh, the most educated person is a primary school teacher. There's somebody who's in the military, but is now a civilian. That's it. Next step, I'm trying to go very quickly. Next step is at the land's office. And when money has exchanged hands, and what has to be done has been done in the land office, the ordinary Kenyans, usually on ancestral land, it was inherited from their great-great-grandfather, it came down to the father, etc., etc. One morning, they see people invade them carrying files. And they're informed that this ancestral land of theirs does not actually belong to them. It belongs to somebody else. And they need to move out pronto. Now, in case they somehow gather the resources to fight this out in court, it is a futile exercise. They will never win. Why? Because these people have done their homework. Everything is sorted out at the land's office. There is no way they can win. Especially if they don't know somebody very powerful in government. That's the only way this kind of thing can be stopped. And we can't all know somebody powerful in government. End of story. That land is gone. Imenda. Imenda kabisa. Now fast forward to the current controversy at Mavoko. Okay. We have been told that the Mavoko land is ancestral land. Yeah, and the owners of that ancestral land formed a land buying company. And then made the decision to sell off parcels of the land. 
actually to sell off the whole 4,000 plus acres of the land. By the way, you need to know another trick used by these evil people. When a land buying company is formed, be very suspicious. It is usually formed to mask, to hide the real power and moving force behind this land grabbing. Okay? Now, an interesting piece of information about the East African Portland cement yeah, rubbishes this claim about this being ancestral land. Yeah, it rubbishes it completely. Okay? And that piece of information is as follows. The East African Portland Cement Company was incorporated. Do you know which year? <laughs> it was incorporated in the year 1933. 1933. Why is that piece of information so important? Simply put, if this company was incorporated in the 70s, 80s, then this story about ancestral land would make sense. Even if it was incorporated in the 1960s or 50s, it might make a little sense. But 1933? <laughs> I remember growing up because this is the road we used to use every weekend going to Oshago, every Christmas going to Machakos. And my late political lecturer was always showing off his knowledge of the terrain. He would always point out to that long stretch that belongs to East African Portland cement. He would say, and that was in the mid-70s, early 80s. Bottom line, it is safe to assume that this land was grabbed. The evidence is staring at us. But hold on a minute. Banks took title deeds on this disputed piece of land and gave out loans. Now we all know if there is anybody more thorough than banks about to dish out loans in investigating a piece of land and its history. <laughs> I don't know. Hakuna. There's nobody who's more thorough than banks. So banks took the fake title deeds, looked at them, took them to lawyers, took them to land's office, and they got a green light. Gave out that loan. This is legit. And that brings us to the crux of this problem. Okay? And it is this issue of land grabbers legitimizing land grabbing, legalizing it in such a way that it is very difficult to challenge even in a court of law. We need to understand that. It's a very important point. East African Portland Cement, in my opinion, are very lucky only because of that piece of information I have already shared. This is an old company incorporated in Kenya in 1933. They were on the ground in the 30s. That is the only thing which saved them. Why? Because even if the records cannot be traced at the land's office in Kenya, even if they've been messed up at the land's office in Kenya, there is another source of information that will finish that argument in a flash. In England, London, the lands guys there will sort it out. There will be records of what the East African Portland Cement owned in the year 1933 and before that. Now I hope by now you have already realized something very alarming. Okay? But let me spell it out in case you've missed it. What this story tells us is that nobody, and I mean nobody, buying land in Kenya today, anywhere in the Republic, is safe. Yeah? You cannot confidently say 
that what happened to the poor Mavoko investors and settlers, whatever you want to call them, you cannot safely say that that cannot happen to you or me. You can't. The rot in Kenya is too much. It is stinking to the high heavens. Yeah, but don't worry. We're in the season of judgment. He kitiote tasafishwa kabisa kabisa. Let me just leave it there. So, who were the people who were behind this land grab that has caused so much pain and tears at Mavoko? Yeah, amongst our fellow Kenyans. And in case you didn't know, there is at least one case so far of somebody who took his own life as a result of the current ongoing demolitions. They committed suicide. At least one so far. Oh God Almighty have mercy. So who are the people responsible for the original grabbing of this land? Who are they? Actually, they are well known. Some of them are very prominent members of society. Some of them are elected leaders. Some of them are your favorite politicians. Some of them, some of us here, are rooting to be the next president of Kenya. And I'm serious. So who are these people? Now, there is a legislator from Kangundo constituency, a man called Honorable Fabian Muli. He belongs to the Mungano Party. Yeah, Mungano Party is a very interesting political party in Kenya. It was founded by the former Makweni governor, Kivuda Kibwana. It is a political party of the future with very high ideals. It may not be prominent now, but it is a party of the future. So Fabian Muli has been elected twice on the Mungano Party ticket. So he's not in Wiper. Now, this politician had some very interesting remarks to make recently. And I have put a link to that video. It's a short video, don't worry. You know, I think about three, four minutes. Where he says it all. He even names names. Yeah, but he doesn't say it directly. He talks like a politician. You have to read between the lines. Let me tell you a story that will help you to fill in the blanks. You are a politician and you go into an election and you lose. Now politicians are used to easy money. Many, many deals, including these kind of land deals. Yeah, let's get that right. So suddenly you're out in the cold. What do you do? You go and you make a deal. That is exactly how the Mavoko land was grabbed from the East African Portland cement. Okay? And you'll forgive me, I cannot mention names for now. And that neatly explains what has been happening in the Mavoko area. When this controversy exploded, there are many politicians who have visited the area and talked to the people, made speeches, encourage the people which is strange when there's something in court as Fabian Muli points out very correctly when there's a matter in court which has been decided by the courts the thing to do is not to hold a political meeting the thing to do is to look for lawyers and appeal a court decision in a court of law doesn't that make sense to you but this is not what happened in Mavoko what happened in Mavoko is that politicians were all over this issue making comments accusations counter accusations and i'm sure all this was in a bit to confuse kenyan's father yeah and mask the truth bury the truth so that no kenyans are focusing on the real issue and the real culprits now the latest twist in this saga is even more puzzling because the East African Portland cement have now decided that they're going to sell this parcel of land after all and they're giving priority to those who are already occupying the said 
real estate now hold on a minute what is this you go to court and you fight a battle for decades and then at the end of it all after demolishing people's houses after causing people so much pain you say now you want to sell it i smell a rat there and you should too what should have happened here at the very latest after the court ruling in their favor the company would have decided to sell this land but why go and demolish people's houses first why now if you thought the rot ends there you're very mistaken because there is a story behind the east african portland cement okay which i'm going to tell you the company has been facing a lot of challenges recently in boardroom battles with the government okay the government's position is that it should be the rightful majority owner of this company able to appoint directors able to make key decisions but another investor lafarge the same people who own bamburi cement have said no and they've gone to court and the court has ruled in favor of lafarge now on your screens right now you can see the ownership of east african portland cement at first glance the government is indeed the majority shareholder because of nssf but the courts ruled that the national social security fund is not actually owned by the government it is owned by those kenyans contributing to the funds and therefore the government is a minority shareholder not able to make those big decisions that is what the court decided but guess what the boardroom battles have not ended they are still ongoing and the new administration in case you didn't know already has a reputation in the corporate world for bullying corporations okay and let me give you another piece of very interesting information the government is interested in part of this mavoko land about 1500 acres to put up an export processing zone okay just put that information at the back of your mind as we proceed now from here we should actually join the dots and maybe even do a little speculation but it is difficult to get concrete evidence of what is really happening here however there is a very bad smell coming out of this one that should be obvious now who is to benefit from this latest move we have seen where the portland cement fellows want to sell this controversial parcel of land and they're giving first priority to those who are already on the ground yeah those already occupying the said real estate who benefits from this the portland cement company who are the owners of the portland cement company yes they're ongoing boardroom battles but we know that the government is a significant shareholder in the east african portland cement company that we know and of great interest is the amount of money involved because what is the value of an acre at mavoko currently it is roughly between 10 and 13 million kenya shillings so out of the 10000 people who are already landowners here land owners on a grabbed piece of land how many of those will be able to afford that kind of money just think about it and how many will be in a position yeah to take a loan out of a bank to be able to pay the east african portland cement for land they've already paid for before and developed and maybe suffered great damage and loss how many of them are going to be able to afford to take out that loan i think you'll agree with me very few so what is going to happen yeah if you're familiar with what happens in kenya 
deals are going to be made. People are going to come in and get very good deals according to them. Actually, I see big politicians yeah, hiding in the shadows. Deals that will take advantage of the people who are already suffering. That is Kenya for you. Now, I am convinced that the government would have intervened and stopped the demolition, the destruction of houses, some of the mansions, schools, churches that were already on this property. But they did not. Why? Putting myself in the shoes of the government, these are 10,000 people who pay taxes. And my government currently is desperately looking for those taxes. So why should I allow a situation where 10,000 taxpayers are wiped out of my list? Because let's be realistic. Even if you'll still collect VAT and other taxes, there are many other important taxes you'll no longer be able to collect from these 10,000. And I'm assuming these are the people in society who are heavy taxpayers. Why allow that situation when you are on a mission to ensure that you collect as much tax as possible? The only reason I can think of is maybe there was something else more important than this. Yeah, There was another priority agenda in this Mavoko Manenos. Hey, let me just leave it at that. I believe I've given you more than enough to chew on and arrive at your own conclusions. And even more important, I believe the whole issue is now very clear. And you can easily be able to predict what is going to go down next. Very sad. Oh, it is so sad. I feel the pain. As if I was one of those 10,000 at Mavoko. I feel their pain. It is terrible. Kwanza when the economy is where it is now. Ay, 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 ay. It is pain plus pain. Squared, multiplied, etc, etc. <sighs> now before I go very quickly. I want to remind you about Ile Kitabu ya Zakayo. <laughs> You can see details on your screens right now. Take advantage of our current offer. I assure you, this is one decision you will never regret. Because just like this video has been a aha moment for you, a moment of opening your eyes, I assure you that this audiobook will do the same for you. For only a mere 2,455 Kenya shillings or $24.55 only and you'll begin to understand so many other things that may not be clear now and more importantly you will be able to understand that actually the country called Kenya is in much more serious trouble than you can ever imagine. Please use those details that you see on your screens right now. Until next time, this is Chris Komekucha.